Okay, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome you all back after uh, a week off. Hope everyone had a nice time. I was in Arizona. It was awesome. Um, it's a pleasure this week to welcome Leroy Poff from Colorado State University. As you can see, Leroy is in the Department of Biology uh, there, and he runs the graduate program in ecology, which is a fairly big enterprise comparable to SENS here, perhaps 150, 160 uh, folks in that program. And as many of you know, Leroy is a, a really a world leader in conservation and restoration of riverine ecosystems and exploring this area of, uh, of ecological flows. And I, I learned this afternoon that folks at the Water Security Agency here are using some of your techniques, so there'll be some interesting discussions perhaps at the, the pub later on. Uh, Leroy has been president of the NABS, the North, North American Benthological Society. I uh, served as associate editor for LNO, Limnology and Oceanography, and has been an, on the editorial board for, of uh, freshwater biology. Uh, he served as a consultant to the Nature Conservancy and has worked quite closely with Brian Richter, who runs the kind of Nature Conservancy's uh, global uh, uh, streamflow program. Uh, he's also been a professor laureate at CSU and the College of Natural Science. Uh, and is an ISI highly cited researcher, as many of you know in reading some of Leroy's uh, papers. Uh, he's a fellow of the AAAS, and uh, is working currently on several projects in the Western United States, in Ecuador, where he leads a large uh, multidisciplinary uh, investigation you may hear about a little bit today, and has uh, also research projects going on in Australia. So it's a real delight to have Leroy with us and to hear uh, this afternoon about sustaining freshwater ecosystems. Leroy. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Can you hear me out there? It sounds pretty loud here. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's my first visit to Saskatoon, and uh, I'm really delighted that the weather is holding, and it uh, reminds me a bit of, of Colorado, where I come from. Um, so today, uh, I want to talk with you about uh, the su subject of sustaining freshwater ecosystems in the Anthropocene. And I guess before doing that, I would just say as a, a little bit of a, a background that, uh, you know, I'm a river ecologist, stream ecologist, and I started working at the interface of hydrology and ecology about 25 years ago. Uh, not because I was so motivated by the issue of sustainability per se, but because I was very interested in how uh, ecological systems uh, vary in their structure and function as in response to hydrologic uh, conditions. And um, so over the last 25 years, however, my, my research has sort of coalesced into uh, the desire to build a framework that's theory-based and general uh, that can be applied to the increasing problems that we're having globally in terms of uh, the decline of freshwater systems. And uh, so I try to think about hydrology, uh, I think about it a lot, but through an ecological lens. And that's what I'll tell you about today, is sort of how uh, the work that I've done over the years and uh, is really sort of hydroecological research that's aimed at uh, now, I think, a, 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 through the last few years has become a good fr a foundation for thinking about t techniques for uh, sustaining freshwater ecosystems. So, let's see if I get this right. So this word Anthropocene is something that I resisted for a few years, but it's now sort of inevitable. It's, it's, a, it's a term that's entered our lexicon. And um, I pulled this off at, at one of the Anthropocene websites. Um, so, of course, here's the, you know, the famous a hockey stick kind of uh, temperature uh, increasing. You know, we're really faced with some big challenges, I think, in the coming years as human population continues to grow, uh, as uh, there's more demand for fresh water, which is already limiting in many regions, uh, climate change, to really try to uh, break through and think about the future in a way that we can actually achieve some kind of sustainability. And this is a big challenge for us culturally as well as scientifically. Uh, this is a, a little um, map that shows airline networks and ro road networks and cities. And up here, I think I found uh, Saskatoon. 
up here, so then maybe right there. Does that look right? Uh, it's a you know it's a it's a modified it's a human dominated world, and that's something that I think we've all come to just accept in the last few uh, few years, and. You know, this poses big challenges for natural resources management and for ecological system sustainability as humans continue to dominate the planet. So, uh, you know, freshwaters are particularly in, at risk. Uh, you know, they only occupy 1% of, you know, far less than 1% of, of, of uh, the Earth's water. And on a sort of an aerial basis, which is what this map, this uh, figure shows, this is uh, this is an index uh, of 100 in 1970. What we see is that freshwater's uh, diversity is declining at a much faster rate than marine or terrestrial uh, systems. So, you know, this is a big concern. Uh, you know, there are 10 to 20,000 freshwater species that are extinct or imperiled, and this number will surely increase in the future. It's sh showing some of the more uh, charismatic freshwater fauna here. Uh, freshwater systems, rivers and streams also provide a lot of ecosystem goods and services, and on this sort of uh, per hectare basis here of uh, value that from an, uh, a, a classic study, which has been criticized for reasons we won't go into today, the point is that uh, rivers, streams, lakes, wetlands, over here provide a tremendous amount of goods and services despite the fact uh, that they are effectively rare on the planet. So the per hectare production of freshwater systems is really, very really high. So these are the kinds of things that we have to worry about going forward in trying to sustain these freshwater systems. Now there are lots of threats. Uh, the main threat that I'll talk about today and a lot of my research has been around the issue of dams. Uh, so this is Three Gorges Dam, and uh, you know, so the threats are our current alteration of these uh, systems, mostly dams. This in increasing human population growth and uh, more demand for fresh water is leading to the calls for more dams. So how do we think about constructing and operating these new dams based on what we've learned from the past? And, of course, there are many agents of global change. Uh, and one that's really, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about later, non-native species is, uh, you know, a, 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 a new emerging threat to many freshwater ecosystems. So ultimately, we have to ask ourselves, how will we balance uh, ecosystem health with human well-being? And it's pretty clear that, you know, as, as a society and as cultures, that we exploit fresh water for our uh, for our well-being, and that's, that's uh, perfectly natural, but we need to start thinking about more how we might balance the, uh, you know, the needs of ecosystems given the increasing demand for fresh water on a, on a global scale. So, if we're going to manage for ecological or ecosystem sustainability and resilience, then I want to you know, state a premise that, that sort of guides my work, which is, you know, if we really want to support functional, self-sustaining ecosystems, if that's our goal, that's, I think, probably that would be a broadly acceptable social goal, then we need to know how these systems function. Okay, we need to understand the underlying uh, principles that dictate how ecosystems function, how they provide this, uh, these goods and services, and how they sustain biodiversity. And so that's what I want to talk about today, largely, is how rivers function from a hydrologic perspective, and then uh, how dams have modified that function, and what we might do about that uh, in the future. All right, so the uh, rubric under which this work occurs, and that I'll talk about is the issue of environmental flows. And uh, environmental flows, are, were defined fairly succinctly uh, in a 2007 conference in Brisbane, Australia that I, that I had the pleasure of attending uh, as uh, the quantity, timing, and quality 
of water flows required to sustain freshwater and estuarine systems and the human livelihoods uh, and well-being that depend on those ecosystems. So what we see is the key components of this definition are quantity, quality, and timing of water, the seasonality at which water moves through a system, and uh, it encompasses both ecosystem health and human well-being. So this is a very broad and I think uh, very useful definition. And of course, you know, the devil's, the devil's in the details as they, as, they, uh, as they say. So why focus on flow? I mean, rivers and aquatic systems are influenced by a variety of variables, variety of factors, not just flow, temperature, you know, sediment, uh, nutrients. Uh, but, you know, the hydrologic alteration that is caused by land use change, by the uh, building and operation of dams, are very highly significant and they fundamentally alter the way eco these ecosystems function. And it's something that we can potentially uh, rectify in some, in some circumstances. So, you know, rivers, here's a nice picture from the Rocky Mountain National Park near where I live. And, uh, you know, there are all these processes that occur in rivers, you know, upstream, downstream connectivity, you know, overbanking flows, you know, alluvial uh, groundwater coming in. Um, you know, exchange with the atmosphere. You know, I've, been talking, I've been talking a lot with people about hill slopes today <laughs> in Jeff's group. Uh, and, you know, they're uh, utterly co complex systems, right? And we could, we could think of them in all kinds of complex ways. But I want to sort of simplify this down to a level that maybe has sort of direct management implications. And that is that, you know, hydrology is critical to these functions. And hydrology we often think of as being sort of a master variable in terms of structuring aquatic systems. Okay. And so the conceptual foundation that I will proceed from for this, uh, for this presentation is this uh, idea of the stream flow as a master variable. Okay. And this tr dates back to the late 90s in a paper that I published with some colleagues, uh, including... Uh, Brian Richter was on this one as well. Uh, Dave Allen, who was my uh, postdoc mentor, um, in which we sort of put together the evidence for how flow regimes structure uh, riverine ecosystems. And the sort of the thumbnail, sort of the, the quotable from this work uh, is that, you know, the structure and function of river ecosystems and the adaptations of species that live in those systems, in many cases, uh, are dictated by the pattern of temporal variation in, the, uh, in river flows, okay? And so this was, uh, you know, a circa 1997, uh, you know, PowerPoint drawing. Uh, it could certainly be rendered more beautifully uh, these days, but we'll, we'll go with it. So basically, you know, here's ecological integrity, which is something that we uh, sort of would like to aspire to in our, in our ecosystems, okay? Uh, you can think of this as, you know, ecosystem goods and services uh, as well. And there are these, you know, sort of factors that, that influence that integrity, uh, water quality, energy sources, you know, physical habitat, biotic interactions, and flow regime, but we've elevated flow regime up to the sort of, you know, higher level driver that uh, even influences how these conditions, how these particular uh, aspects, you know, these factors at the intermediate level may influence ecological integrity. So this idea that you know, hydrology is a, a dominant driver is one that has really resonated and I think is a very important perspective to, to uh, allow us to move forward in trying to achieve some, uh, some measure of sustainability. And I'll, I'll spend the rest of the time talking about that. <clears throat> So we can think of this flow regime, this natural flow regime in, the, in sort of uh, the sense that, you know, every region has a climate, right? And it, each river has a natural flow regime. And those, you know, the, the similarity in flow regimes among rivers may, may be small or it may be large. And that's oftentimes uh, defined or mediated by the climate and by watershed factors that influence, you know, runoff processes, you know, overland flow versus groundwater flow, let's say. And so from an ecological perspective, we think about, you know, the hydrograph and uh, sort of hydrologic events 
And we can think, you know, of many ways to think about this, but certainly three ways to think about it are, you know, high flows are important because they, they scour, they move the bed, they overbank, the, you know, overbank and sustain riparian ecosystems. Uh, low flows are also important, base flows. You know, if a, if a stream goes dry, then that's a very significant ecological threshold. Um, and temporal variability, sort of, you know, are they stable, do they move around a lot because that interrupts resource acquisition uh, activities by organisms, it, uh, you know, creates habitat instabilities. So we can think about these sort of general kinds of, you know, relevant flow events. And if we look at a sort of an extreme and interesting example of a, this is a, a stream from uh, Oklahoma in the U.S. Uh, that we see, well, it has a lot of high event, lot, this is a log scale, okay, uh, the discharge. This is the day of the water year. I presume in Saskatchewan you're familiar with the water year. Uh, so o October 1 out here and then jet September 30 over here. And this is going back in time from 1985 and this back to 1955. So 30 years of record. And <clears throat> what we see in this particular system is it has a lot of high flows and a lot of low flows. There's a lot of zeros down here. You can see them all. It changes very rapidly. Uh, it's very variable. And so we can think of, you know, characterizing that pattern in ecologically meaningful terms with respect to these, uh, you know, kinds of events. We can think about, you know, how big are the bigs and how small are the smalls? How frequently do they occur? How long do they last? Is there any timing or predictability in, in, those, in that signal? In this case, clearly not. And sort of the rate of change from you know, low to high conditions, that can also be ecologically important. And so I'm not going to go into all the ecological details of why, you know, there are many, many examples of why these uh, characteristics are important. Uh, but the, the point I want to make is if we then uh, take a map of unregulated streamflow gauges in the United States that uh, you know, represent relatively unimpaired flows. That, and, we, and we look at the flow regimes from all of these locations, clearly a big high, you know, climatic gradient, and we think about, uh, think about them in terms of magnitude, frequency, duration, timing, and so forth. What we see is there are very distinct differences among stream flow types, if you will. And this is work that I did, I started actually in my PhD, in my dissertation, in my PhD uh, program. And then, um, you know, I've carried on through the years. So, for example, here's a stream in Arizona that has, uh, it's intermittent much of the year. It has uh, big winter, you know, floods, big uh, frontal systems coming through here, and then summer monsoon out here. Okay, so uh, I, I classified streams across the U.S. according using this kind of approach, and I call this one intermittent flashy. It's not so important, the name. Uh, here's a snowmelt system from Colorado. It's got this, this log scale again. It's got this very dominant, you know, peak flow period in late June, early, uh, you know, mid-June, late June. Okay, uh, so these systems, you know, occur up the spine of the Rocky Mountains and, of course, you know, here in Canada as well. Uh, winter rain systems in the Pacific Northwest, very high base flows, uh, a lot of winter storm activity here from, you know, the uh, winter uh, you know, the rain events in the winter. Uh, and then recession into this really high sort of stable base flow period during the summer. So these are very ecologically different kinds of, uh, of, of uh, habitats. There's this uh, harsh intermittent stream that I showed you before that's sort of uh, variable on pretty much all time scales. Uh, here's an example of a groundwater fed stream. It's a very high base flows and not much, you know, when, when there are rain events, it doesn't respond rapidly, so it's fairly stable. Okay. Uh, then in the eastern U.S., an example of something that's perennial but very flashy, it's, you know, varies quite a bit. So these, uh, all of you can see in terms of the magnitude, frequency, timing, and so forth, that there are really differences in these, in these, uh, in these flow regimes. And so the idea is that these different flow regimes, because of the, uh, you know, these particular characteristics, are going to have 
a measurably different ecological uh, structure and function. And that's been, that's been uh, well shown for, for many, uh, in many studies. All right. So just to take a little bit more sort of a, a, a peek into some of the, uh, the, the ecology, if we take an idealized uh, hydrograph like this, uh, you know, we have interannual variability around this, you know, sort of seasonal pattern. Um, the timing of these high flows is important uh, for things like allowing organisms to access, you know, access floodplains if they're, you know, spawning fishes or to uh, sustain uh, riparian systems. Uh, the flood peak can be important for, uh, you know, the high flows are important for allowing for lateral and longitudinal connectivity in, uh, in these systems. And base flows, the level of base flow is obviously important for su sustaining alluvial aquifers and for uh, providing in-stream habitat for, uh, for organisms. So if we modify, if we put a dam on this system, you know, and clip off these peak flows, then that's going to have some expected ecological consequences. And I'll give you one example. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> some work that really was sort of best characterized uh, by some Canadians. Stuart Root over in Alberta was the one who sort of came up with this idea of a recruitment box for cottonwoods, plains cottonwoods. So uh, we have a hydrograph, a snowmelt hydrograph, and during this peak flow, uh, we get scouring of the floodplain and deposition of fresh sediment that then uh, moist soil that uh, cottonwoods uh, release their seeds at the, about the time of the receding limb of this hydrograph. And so uh, these seeds land on this uh, fresh substrate, and then uh, they, they grow. Uh, the, seed, the, the, the roots of these seeds grow at a rate that, uh, uh, if, if the rate of recession on this, uh, you know, off the floodplain is such that the, the root seedlings, the, the seedling roots can maintain contact with the groundwater, then they'll succeed, okay? Um, and then the base flows down here help sustain adult trees, okay? So, um, now we'll get to, you know, what happens if you put a dam on a system with that kind of ecological dependencies, hydroecological dependencies. Certainly, you know, dams are a ubiquitous feature of the landscape, you know, globally. And we see that with this figure, okay? These are, these are just large dams, okay? 6,800 really large dams. Uh, in the U.S., we have a good database on dams, and there's 75,000 or so dams that are greater than two meters in height, okay? And if we look over the 20th century, we see that, you know, th most of those dams were being built post-World War II, you know, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, okay? And now we're starting to see this pattern repeated for, uh, you know, the developing economies uh, around the world. So dams have many effects, and I want to talk about a couple of effects, local and regional. Uh, so, you know, we talk about you know, the effect of an individual dam, but, you know, dams also have effects uh, on, on a region-wide scale. And that's something that has really not been well appreciated, but it's something that's important going forward in thinking about how we uh, do water resources, you know, planning and uh, uh, positioning of dams in, in watersheds. So uh, here's a typical kind of effect of a dam. So here's a two-dimensional hydrograph of the Green River below uh, Glen Canyon Dam in, in Wyoming. And we see uh, before the dam, there were lots of, these are annual, high, annual peak flows. Uh, and we see a lot of big peaks after the dam, uh, except for 1983 or so. Mostly all those big peaks were, were taken away. Okay. This is a three-dimensional hydrograph. So uh, the dam comes in here before the dam. We've got uh, high spring runoff here, snow melt, low base flows in the fall and winter. After the dam, the base flows have been elevated and the peaks have been reduced. So it's a very different hydrologic regime and has very uh, significant ecological consequences. So if we go, oh, and um, the, you know, we can measure the effects of dams on hydrographs by simply you know, calculating what happened, you know, what the hydrograph was like before the dam versus after the dam, and we can get a sense of how much of a change there is. And sometimes that, you know, that degree of change is an indicator of the ecological impairment. 
And this uh, Brian Richter and his group developed this uh, Indicators of Hydrologic Alteration, which is a list of about 32 such metrics that one could calculate to assess quantitatively the effect of a dam on, uh, on river flow. <clears throat> now, if we go back to uh, our recruitment box idea here, and here's our pre-dam uh, flow regime, the dotted line, and this is not an unreasonable sort of cartoon of a post-dam altered flow regime with the higher base flows and the reduced peak, but also notice here that there's also a shift in timing from an earlier snow melt to you know, later. Uh, and if, depending on that shift, so two things happen. Um, one is that you know, the floodplain may not be now accessible for cottonwood recruits, okay, because of this reduced peak. But also, even if it is, the timing may be such that the seedlings are not available to colonize those available substrates uh, after the, the floodplains inundated because the, the, the seedlings are only released during this you know, period of time, but now the peak flows and the, the, uh, the, the availability of, uh, the ability of the flow to put those seedlings in contact with the habitat, the new habitat has, uh, is no longer there because the timing has been shifted. So this is something I think that uh, one thing that I think people have really started to begin to appreciate is that the timing of flows is just as important or can be just as important as the quantity of flows. Okay? It's not that they're both important. Okay. And we see this throughout the western U.S. where we've lost, we have sort of geriatric cottonwood stands. There's no longer recruiting below dams because of this, uh, you know, the shift in timing and peak flow. And they're being replaced by uh, invasive uh, salt cedars, at least in the, in the U.S. And so if we take this idea of environmental flows, let's restore some of the natural flow pattern in order to restore some of the ecological processes and patterns. Uh, you know, this has been quite successful in, 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 in several cases. So uh, one of the more famous ones is the Truckee River in Nevada, uh, in the U.S. So here we see these, it's an old picture that shows these geriatric tree stands here. Uh, you know, it's taken in the winter, they're not dead, they just don't have leaves on them. Okay, but we don't see any, there, there are no young trees here. They're all old trees. And this, uh, this is a river section below a large dam. So uh, the flows were released intentionally to restore these uh, native riparian vegetation. And uh, we see that all these seedlings were recruited. Okay. And then uh, they began to grow. The saplings uh, were uh, successful. And eventually, there were stands of, you know, stands of adults. So this one artificial flow release from this dam restored the hydroecological characteristics that allow the cottonwoods to, you know, to recover. <clears throat> All right. So uh, I want to go through this. I won't be able to explain all the details on, on this, but I want to give you this one example of some work I did on the regional effects of dams. And, you know, there's a question about whether, it, you know, dams have effects below their structures, but they also uh, may be having a broader impact on uh, biodiversity and regional scale ecological patterns uh, because there are so many dams. And um, so... We did this work several years ago that asked this question of whether dams are homogenizing regional scale differences in sort of hydrologic patterns. And we, you know, we used a very excellent, uh, you know, data source, the U.S. stream flow gauges. Uh, a lot of gauges we looked at, a lot of dams that were close to the, you know, close to the gauges. And so we, uh, we, wanted, we had some criteria that we wanted to use, you know, to uh, see what the effect of the dam was on the hydrograph over the 20th century. And uh, we, so we have, you know, uh, had to have a pretty long flow record. There could be no upstream dams, uh, minimum number of tributaries above the gauge, you know, minor tributary dams. And out of that big data set, we came up with 186 pairs of, uh, of gauge that was close to a dam that had a pre and post record. And um, 
These red dots here represent those gauges, uh, those pairs, and these, the, the U.S. here is color-coded into different sort of eco-regions. So these are the regions that we're uh, thinking about, you know, as, as sort of hydrologically uh, distinct, or that's the hypothesis. Uh, the sentinel gauges, we also picked uh, gauges that were undammed that represented sort of nat that captured the signal of natural climatic variation, okay? And um, these are smaller streams. Most larger rivers have been dammed, but, you know, on third to seventh order streams, and it, you know, it turns out that, you know, if you do the sort of the back of the envelope, that there, is, uh, well, there are a lot of dams, but every 50 kilometers, you know, there's a dam on average in, in the U.S., okay? <clears throat> so you can imagine that might have some, you know, larger scale effects. And so uh, we, we characterize these, uh, these uh, hydrographs using 16 variables, uh, considered about maximum flows and minimum flows and the average max and the measure of the variation in that, you know, interannual variation in the maximum and the minimum. And then we're concerned about the magnitude, the frequency, the duration, and the timing of these, uh, you know, the maximum and minimum flows. And basically, uh, what we see is if, uh, using a statistical technique that I won't really go into much detail about, uh, we can look at the pre-dam uniqueness of uh, all those 16 regions, okay, and the post-dam uh, uniqueness, okay. So, if there's no change, if, you know, we would expect all the points, all the 16 regions to sort of fall along this line, uh, if, they, if they became more similar after dams, we would expect the points to be down in this region, and if they were uh, less similar after dams, we would expect the 16 points to uh, be in this region. So for free-flowing rivers, basically here's what we found. So for example, region number two is pretty uh, unique compared to other regions, but it doesn't change pre and post, you know, the first half and the second half of the 20th century. And so for all of these free-flowing rivers, they basically are not showing any signs of, despite there was, you know, climatic variation over the 20th century, despite it was, it was sort of generally wetter in the U.S. Over the, in the last latter half of the 20th century, uh, these, all of these systems are generally not being changed. Uh, you know, they're, they're the same in terms of their um, relationship uh, pre and post mid-century. So there's no evidence that, you know, that climate variability is, is uh, causing any kind of homogenization. But if we look at the, uh, here's the previous graph I showed you, if we look at the dammed rivers, what we see is that now they've all become much more similar, okay? And uh, so dams are basically causing regions that were historically, uh, you know, dissimilar to become much more similar. And that's, that's what we refer to as homogenization. And this has, you know, implications for biodiversity maintenance because, you know, if, you, if all of the hydro systems are now more or less the same or becoming more similar, then that, that minimizes or that diminishes uh, uh, ecological habitat. And so this simply shows that, you know, the, the redder the region, sort of the more it's changed and so sort of the bigger effect that dams have had in making that region uh, less unique. And uh, this is a really busy graph, but the main thing is that here are 16 regions down here, and what we see with these open circles is that maximum flows are reduced. That's the, sort of the big driver of creating this homogenization. And minimum flows are, uh, the variation is uh, reduced. Minimum flows are increased in many regions. And then the timing, uh, the timing and frequency and durations are not that much affected in this particular study. So anyway, uh, this is one of the only studies that shows that dams can have a regional, perhaps even a continental scale effect on sort of hydroecological uh, relationships. All right, so I'm going to go back now to talk about environmental flows and uh, some sort of, you know, where we are with that. Um, you've seen this. You know, we, this is a fairly, I guess you might say, enlightened definition 
Uh, it's, it's the, it, this was not how environmental flows were first construed, okay? And there, so there's been some evolution of the concept of environmental flows as we have learned more scientifically and as, you know, cult social values have changed. Um, <clears throat> you know, and in terms of the sort of uh, modern environmental flow idea, it really sort of, you know, started emerging in the late 80s, okay? Um, and then uh, through the 90s and 2000s, it became sort of consolidated. Uh, now it's sort of a global, you know, it's globally uh, uh, appreciated and embraced. And, uh, you know, I think we're facing some challenges. We're now sort of in a period of, I think, change in how we think about environmental flows because we're now dealing with non-stationarity and, uh, you know, being faced with all these challenges of the Anthropocene, you know, growing human demand for water and, you know, non-native species invasion and so forth. So uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, sort of, you know, the, this trans, I guess this transition here between where we are now and sort of what challenges us to go forward. <clears throat> so I would say, you know, environmental flows has probably arrived, if you will. It's widely, you know, understood, it's widely practiced, uh, there's a, you know, academic, there's a textbook on environmental flows now. Um, it's been embraced by state agencies, uh, by m many state agencies in the U.S. So what's the framework for environmental flows in, uh, in theory and practice? <clears throat> well, so this is a, a you know, some, some colleagues and I have, over the last several years, became very concerned about making environmental flows a more rigorous and sort of empirically based science. And uh, I'm going to tell you about, uh, you know, the, the approach that, that's being used here in a moment. But uh, basically, if, if, you know, if we want to develop a framework for developing uh, environmental flow standards, if you will, not just for an individual river, but for, you know, at a regional scale across many rivers, then uh, there have to be some criteria that are satisfied. And so, uh, you know, this, the first of these would be the ability to address many rivers simultaneously and then explicitly link ecology to flow alteration. Okay, so oftentimes we don't know how much alteration is too much alteration. We need to have, you know, better ecological understanding of, of that simple question. Um, let's see. So also this framework would need to be, um, you know, apl applicable across a spectrum of types of flow alteration. Uh, many places would not have, you know, either the, the scientific capacity or the data availability to do precise studies. So a framework that's going to be general and regionally applicable needs to um, deal with this question. Um, and ideally would be applicable in a variety of social and governance context. So in about four years ago, a group of uh, about 18 or 19 people had a retreat in, at a beautiful spot in California, which uh, we talked about this, you know, how do we develop this framework? And so uh, we came up with this this paper and this framework, which we call the Aloha framework, the ecological limits of hydrologic alteration, and the, you know the the motivation for doing this is to have a scientifically credible way of assigning flow standards to systems that we don't know that much about. Either you know we don't have stream gauges there, we don't have biological information, but we do have our hydroecological understanding. We understand certain principles about how hydrologic regimes interact with ecological systems, and so. This was a big effort that involved international scientists, U.S. Uh, federal agency scientists, academics, uh, nature conservancy, etc. <clears throat> and it's a scientific and social process. And there's sort of four steps that are involved, including a big role, I think, for hydrologists, which is sort of, you know, trying to characterize these flow regimes in ungauged locations. Um, and th those four steps are sort of captured in this figure. So we have the sort of scientific process here of developing baseline hydrographs. It's sort of at the river segment scale of a, you know, the, uh, and classification, which I've talked about before. 
And then within classes of streams, we can say what the geomorphic, uh, you know, what the, the sort of the habitat features are like, whether it's a, like a, a canyon or an alluvial uh, reach. Alteration, characterizing alteration. Uh, so this is also the hydrologic piece up here. Then there's a sort of ecological piece here uh, to you know, define flow ecology relationships, uh, then relate those, how those relationships should change based on the hydrologic alteration. And then there's the social process, which is really important, and I think one that is increasingly uh, we're paying attention to, which is, you know, what are acceptable ecological conditions? We might have a really great scientific understanding of what flow alteration means for ecological process, but, you know, what do people desire? Okay. I think I'll skip that. So, uh, so let's take let's take an example of how. Uh, uh, we'll go back to this. Yeah. So if you know if we think about these uh, flow regime types, this is what we basically want to do for a region. We want to map the flow regime types in that region, and then make predictions or about how ecological change will occur when those flow regimes are modified. So let's take an example of a stable groundwater stream. And uh, so we sort of pick a, uh, you know, a hydrologic variable, like the change in the duration of low flows. You, you put a dam on a, on a river, and you, uh, <coughs> you increase or decrease the low flows. And so here we're increasing the low flows. Here we're decreasing the low flows. And if we pick an ecological response variable, like uh, you know, the native fish abundance, then by using this classification approach, we can, we can select reference streams, and there's a sort of a characteristic range of low flow duration, and there's a characteristic range of variation across these reference streams in terms of the, uh, you know, the native fish abundance. And then we have, if we have some data, maybe it looks like this, you know, we can imagine some different kinds of responses or we could hypothesize these kinds of responses based on our a prior knowledge that would tell us if we increase the flows, you know, if we increase low flows too much, we might cross some threshold. But then this geomorphic setting becomes important because, you know, there, maybe there's a lot of pool habitat or there's a, there's a very low gradient, so the system doesn't, you know, doesn't tend to dry out when we increase those low flows. Therefore, we might be able to sustain uh, you know, native fish, even with re increased low flows because of this, you know, pool habitat. And so this is the kind of thinking that goes into uh, trying to, act, you know, make actionable this Eloha approach. And, you know, it's been fairly successful, I would say. Uh, this is, USGS has many uh, district offices that are actively engaged in this kind of work. Okay. And so, you know, it's a consensus statement. It, it basically tells us that we know enough to get started. Um, we can use it to set initial flow standards that could be updated as we collect more information. And it, it's, it's basically a risk assessment kind of approach and um, based on stakeholder preferences. All right, so very briefly then, I want to go back and talk about some of these challenges that are facing us in the Anthropocene. I think we have a, you have a framework, the Aloha framework, you know, has some, you know, some, some challenges itself, but it's generally a reasonable approach as sort of a first cut to think about regional uh, aquatic conservation. So one of the things that's a challenge is getting more social relevance in, in the Aloha process. So, you know, there are people who now who are working on expanding that Holy Loha framework to think about how, you know, the sort of the, the social process of negotiating uh, desirable ecological endpoints. This is work from Claudia Paul Wostel in Germany, the, the, the EU funded work. Then there's this issue of, you know, stationarity is dead, right? So, the, the, way we the way we think about formulating eFlows now is we've got this historical reference period. We can calculate, you know, magnitude, frequency, duration, and then, you know, we've got this affected period. But as, you know, as climate changes and as land use changes, then this historical reference period sort of 
fades away, right, and becomes not so relevant. Uh, so this is a really important uh, realization that is affecting not only eFlows, but, you know, uh, water resources planning and management as well. So it's a, a, a big, you know, a, a big concern to uh, think about how we need to incorporate this thinking into uh, new eFlows approaches. And here's a, just a little example in Washington State, uh, looking at future climate change. Here's a frequency of streams in Washington that are snowmelt currently. And uh, 40 years from now, the little red part snowmelt and all this other stuff is more rainfall and rain on snow. So, you know, these streams are changing pretty pretty rapidly. And so how do we take that into, you know, our calculus for designing environmental flows? Uh, ecological baselines are shifting. You know, there's really not sort of a reference uh, ecolog ecosystem uh, conditions are hard to identify because, you know, non-native species, for example, are widespread, okay? So, you know, what are we managing toward and, and who decides that? So we're getting into more sort of, you know, again, the sort of the social context. Um, I think a really important challenge and a really critical transition for eFlows is to go from thinking about individual reaches below dams to thinking about watersheds and dam, uh, you know, uh, dam interactions. <clears throat> so, for example, here are you know, some pr proposed dams on the Mekong uh, River, and uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in trying to optimize the, the location of those dams so that it minimizes uh, you know, ecological impact. And there are a lot of dams proposed around the world, and so what have we learned from the 20th century you know, in terms of how we design dams in the future? And finally, um, you know, I think we need to, eFlows needs to, it's sort of the general thing, but it needs to move from being sort of retrospective into more prospective, not restoring to the past, but, you know, uh, trying to, you know, adapt to the future and build resilience into these systems because we don't know how these systems are going to change in the future. And, um, you know, so... Basically, adaptation, you know, is a process for responding to not only the realized impacts of non-stationarity agents like climate change, but also the anticipated impacts. And, you know, I think this is going to lead us more into thinking about uh, more process-based hydroecological relationships. Okay, so not just sort of time average metrics, you know, what's the average frequency and the average duration, but... Uh, you know, m more real-time kinds of considerations, like what do sequences of, you know, drought years mean for the long-term resilience of a system, and how do we sort of buffer against that as opposed to managing for some average condition? And there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot to talk about there. I'd be happy to, you know, have that conversation with, with you afterwards. Um, all right, so I'm going to... In, in trying to honor the 45-minute rule here, uh, you know, I, I, I will just say that I think, you know, we're sort of in a situation now where uh, this sort of ad adaptive, sort of dynamic e-flows kind of situ uh, uh, perspective, I'm seeing that we probably in the future will be, uh, you know, needing to identify our goals explicitly. What is it that we want to sustain uh, in the face of, you know, uh, building dams or operating dams? going to need to say, okay, uh, is that goal, you know, is it attainable under the current water resources management scheme? And if the answer is no, the red, you know, the red arrow, then we'll need to think about how we modify management to achieve that goal, or can we modify management to achieve that goal? If the answer is yes, then, uh, you know, is the desired uh, is the desired state vulnerable to climate change? Okay, I mean, we might be able to modify the water resources uh, framework to s reach a goal, but if climate change is going to impose, make that system vulnerable, then uh, we, have to, we have to go further. Now, uh, if we can't, if, if we're not willing to uh, modify the management to achieve this goal, then basically we're just going to, you know, take no action and, and, and watch what happens. If we can modify it, and it's vulnerable, uh, then we can either take no action, okay, or we can modify the management to reduce vulnerability. 
my arrows are messed up here. Uh, if we're not willing to modify our management to reduce the vulnerability that's associated with you know, prospective climate change, then again, we take no action. But maybe we, are, maybe we can modify management in order to uh, reach some, uh, you know, some desired state. And then the question is, now that's the technical part, the, now the question is, is it socially acceptable? Okay. And there are trade-offs involved, and you know, those have to be identified. If it's uh, not socially acceptable, then you know, we, could, we could revise the goal and then go through the process again. Uh, if, you know, if it is vulnerable and we can make the modifications and it's socially acceptable, then we might take some new actions, some, a some adaptive response to monitor and manage to, in order to sustain a socially desired and attainable, scientifically attainable uh, goal. And, you know, this is going to require, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a big, you know, a big effort, right? This would have to be, uh, what I'm really hopeful in the, in the next few years that we will start seeing, uh, you know, ecologists and hydrologists and, uh, you know, dam operators and lending institutions all being interested in sustainable development, beginning to make some of the hard, uh, you know, to, hard decisions that have to be made about what do we invest our money in in order to sustain, that can be reasonably sustained, versus when do we just say, okay, we, we don't need to put our resources there because it's either not attainable or it's vulnerable to climate change or it's socially unacceptable. And so conservation ecology, I think, and uh, water resources management are, there's an opportunity now with the sort of end of stationarity and with shifting baselines sort of rethink, in my view, rethink how we approach the uh, general question of natural resources management for long-term sustainability. And so um, with that, I would just say thank you for your attention and uh, time permitting, I'd be happy to take any questions. Jeff. <clears throat> All right, time for a few questions. We might use the mic just for the aid of uh, those that are listening in through the simulcast. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the framework that to observe the um, uh, flow alteration, uh, to, uh, to observe the relationship between flow alteration and the ecologic uh, responses. And I have two applying uh, situations. The first one is uh, a bunch of uh, rivers that uh, have different river types. And the second situation is that uh, just one river and the different segments of the river are, have different uh, dominant uh, recharge factors. For example, the, up, uh, the upstreams are snow melt and the downstreams may be groundwater or precipitation. Um, so uh, my question is, um, under which situation you think uh, can the framework work better? In which situation mm -hmm. could this work better? <clears throat> uh, so the two situations are many different flow types on the one hand, and on the other hand, the same river, but that's spatially variable in terms of its hydrologic um, response. Uh, I don't think, I think it could work in either situation. I mean, uh, one, one point I should make about this, um, this approach is it's a very, it's, it's a coarse approach, right? It's not one that is designed to reveal the details about any one location, okay? It's saying, here's the, here's the hydrologic you know, response, here's the hydrologic pattern, here's the alteration, these are the expected kinds of ecological change we would see, okay? So if you can model, in, in one river, if you can model uh, different segments of the river that have you know, different uh, hydrologic characteristics, then you could apply this thinking to that system as well. Uh, I think probably it would be more, that's a hard thing to do. And I think just, you know, as many of you in this room know, uh, to understand 
sort of fine, uh, fine grain variation in hydrologic response usually requires a lot of information. So for groundwater is you know, coming in or, or you have losing reaches of streams, that's not something you can easily acquire from gauge, stream gauge records. So um, I think the, for, any, uh, for any application on an individual river of environmental flows, there will always be much more, uh, you know, much more money spent and understanding those sort of local scale influences will be, uh, there'll be a premium on that. So all the big flow releases on the Colorado River or on the Truckee River I showed you, those are all, you know, very expensive projects that are very site specific. And this ELOHA approach is not site specific, it's more sort of broad, broad scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Graham. You mentioned the example uh, where you did a release from one of the dams to mm -hmm. increase the flows. I think it was in related to the cottonwood seeding process. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the cost, the duration of that release, how much water was released, and how you negotiated that process, whether the framework informed that negotiation or whether the framework resulted as from the experiences mm -hmm. of that negotiation? Yeah, I mean, that's a fair question, but that wasn't actually my, my work, so um, I, don't, I don't know the, the answers to that. Um, I do know that, for example, the release in the Colorado River the, the, back in 1996, the Glen Canyon release, uh, was cost several million dollars in lost hydropower uh, revenue, uh, had several you know, Native American tribes and a dozen or so federal agencies and, you know, just a really complex mix of stakeholders. And, uh, you know, so I think probably the, the spirit of your question is, you know, this, this can, be very, can be pretty messy for an individual site that has a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of stakeholders involved. I mean, one, one a sort of alternative approach that's, you know, is if state or provincial agencies want to promote or sort of use, you know, develop regulations for water quantity, um, water quantity regulations as more of a top-down approach, then that, you know, that can be uh, less controversial at sort of a site, you know, the site scale becomes sort of a matter of state or, or provincial policy. And that's sort of, I, I think we're seeing that happening in the U.S. a bit, and maybe in Alberta as well. I was talking to someone earlier about that. Yes? I have uh, two questions. First, uh, you mentioned about that very nice concept of vulnerability and see how much change in the flow might actually uh, change in the, you know, aquatic, uh, you know, the lifestyle of fishes and how they are vulnerable to that. Mm -hmm. One issue with that is that per because now we mentioned non-stationary is dead, stationary is dead, so perhaps some of the responses of the of the fishes or other species are not known. And in your graph as well, you mentioned that this was a kind of like a threshold behavior. So mm -hmm. you know, up to some threshold, you know, the changes was not make any difference. Mm -hmm. up, up to you, you change that you you move from that threshold, then you have a drastic change. So mm -hmm. if we have a climate change and if we have this non-stationarity through human, uh, you know, activities and management, so how come you can address the uncertainty of your uh, method? Uh, that's I'm my sorry, how, can how you can address the uncertainty of that analysis because some of the threshold are not the uncertainty? known. uncertainty? Yeah. yeah. So well, this is the first question. Second, you know, the dams definitely, the most severe effect of dams is... Can wait, can wait. I'll, let's let's, let's yeah, do sure. the first one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can remember the second two in a row. Uh, well, probably stationarity has never really been alive, but, um, you know, now I think we are accepting the fact that you know, the, the future is going to be different than the past. And so m m my response to that would be, you know, we, we still, we have to learn from the past, okay? So the question is, what do we learn from the past and what do we carry forward? If we learn about sort of statistical relationships between flow and, you know, some pattern, then 
you know, that's a, a correlative statistical model that then if you go outside the, the bounds of that model, yeah, it may be wrong. So, you know, I think that's one of the vulnerabilities right now of the environmental flow, generally how it's practiced, okay? So my answer to that question is we need to think about, uh, hyd you know, eco-hydrological processes. And so uh, I think we, we can think about things like, uh, let's say, fish production as a function of floodplain inundation or as a function of habitat availability in the river. And that's a fundamental relationship. And so we can take that, if we, if we understand that relationship, we can, we can say, okay, we can project the consequence of a future change, okay? So it's really about more of a process level understanding as opposed to a statistical relationship. And I think that's one of the challenges right now for eFlows moving, moving forward because we will be having these, you know, these kinds of issues. Okay, good. Before I, uh, before I thank Leroy for his talk, uh, I want to just uh, make it a couple of announcements. Next <coughs> week is Effie Fufalo Giorgio from University of Minnesota talking about breakthroughs in water engineering as related to water uh, security. Also, of course, we'll be transitioning to Alexander's. Any of you that want to continue the discussion with Leroy and those that may be doing research in this area and would like a little bit of time tomorrow, there is some time in the morning schedule. So come and see me either after the talk now or at the bar later if you'd like to uh, uh, schedule a bit of time perhaps to get some reaction to the work you're doing. So I'd like to uh, join with me to thank Leroy for a really thought-provoking talk. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.